Welcome to Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. This program is sponsored by some area churches of Christ and is dedicated to spreading the everlasting gospel as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The churches of Christ accept the Scriptures as totally inspired of God and the all-sufficient guide for faith and practice. Therefore, they reject all doctrines of men and rely totally on the Bible to direct their course in serving God. It is our pledge to you that each lesson will be the truth as revealed in His Holy Word. Mr. Barnett carefully prepares the graphics so you can clearly see the book, chapter, and verse of each lesson taught. We urge you to either copy the scriptures used or record this program for further study. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need prayer, the Seeking the Lost ministry can be reached toll-free at 1-800-390-7734. It is our prayer that Seeking the Lost will be an important source of information about God's Word and will help you more perfectly worship Him. And now, here is Mr. Barnett. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the Seeking the Lost broadcast. We have a lot of ground to cover today, so we're going to get right after it. The church slash kingdom has always existed. Now, I know that there is a popular theory out there that the kingdom is yet to be established on earth, But that is not true, and I want to talk to you about the church kingdom has always existed. N.B. Hardiman had this to say, the kingdom, friends, has always existed. It existed in purpose, in the mind of God. It existed in promise, as delivered to the patriarchs. It delivered in prophecy, and then it existed in preparation. And last of all, when the New Testament went into effect, it existed in perfection. Let's look and see if this statement is true. I think it is. Take a look at this. The church slash kingdom in purpose. What was the purpose of it to start with? Think about this. Matthew, the 13th chapter. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. Why did he do that? And without a parable, he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken By the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables and I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now you think about that. You just let your mind drift back all the way to Adam and Eve. Go back further and ask yourself there was a moment in which that there was no mountain to look to There was no ocean. There was no beach for it to wash on. There was nothing. And he's talking about the foundation of the world. He's talking about something that was there at the foundation of the world. And, of course, we're talking about the kingdom or the church. Think about that. 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 18. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. And who was that, of course? Why, it was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, without blemish and without spot. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. And so I suggest to you that the Scriptures teach plainly that the kingdom church existed in purpose before the foundation of the world. Now, that's a long time ago, before there was a mountain, before there was an ocean before there was an earth in the mind of God and his purpose. It was foreordained from the foundation of the world. That's a long way back, isn't it? Before the world was. Now then, what did God predetermine? This has been a moment of contention among Bible scholars and good God-fearing people all over the time because many people believe that a person is predestined that when he is born, it's already been figured out whether he'll be saved or lost, that he, it's already been figured out whether he'll go to heaven or to hell because of predestination. My friends, this is not what God predetermined, but he did predetermine some things. What did God predetermine? Look at Romans 8. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated, predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you see something there? Look closely at what was predetermined. Look closely. He didn't pick you out of the crowd and say you're going to be lost and pick another person right beside and said you're going to be saved. Now look at this. 
predestined. What was he predestined to be? Saved or lost? That's not what it said. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God had predetermined that those in Christ would be conformed to the image of his son. That was the predestination. <clears throat> Moreover, <clears throat> whom he predestinated, or he predestined those he also called. Now, how is that so? How does God call us? Does he do it with a thunderclap? Does he send lightning down upon us and water us all over the ground and we've been called? That's not. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. How does he call them? Look right here. 2 Thessalonians 2. Wherein too he called you by our what? He called you by the gospel. And so that is the truth about it. Excuse me. <clears throat> we are called by the gospel of Christ. Everybody receives the same call. That is, those who have the gospel preached to them. There are billions of people across the world that's never heard of the gospel. Never heard of the gospel. How can they be called if they're not heard? And you see, that's going to fall upon our shoulders because we haven't carried the gospel to the world as Jesus told us to do when he says, you go unto all the world and you preach the gospel to every creature. I think about the millions of those of the Islamic faith, they've never heard the gospel of Christ. Never heard it. And they believe that Christ existed and that he was a great prophet. But Muhammad is greater than all. He is the last prophet of God. We are commanded to preach the gospel to every soul. Wherein to he calls you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But get back to the exact point you see what God did predetermined. He set up the character, the characterization, the way that you'd be able to identify those who had, were in Christ. They would be predestinated to be the, conformed to the image of the Son. Think of that. Look at this. What did God predestine? Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, every spirit in heavenly places in Christ. Now as far as the temporal blessings are concerned, of course, the rain falls upon the just as well as upon the unjust. But he said that every spiritual blessing is in Christ, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Je by Jesus Christ unto himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And so we're talking about the kingdom or the church. We're talking about it in purpose, in the mind of God. And he predetermined that we would receive the spirit of adoption through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what was predetermined. You make up your own mind if you want to be a part of it. What did God predetermine? He predetermined that we would be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ unto himself. Now let's move it. The church or the kingdom and promise. We talked about it in purpose, that it existed in the mind of God. Now what about in promise? I want you to think about this. This is one of the most amazing studies that you can have that when you go to the scriptures and you begin to trace the golden thread of prophecy that is, starts out in the book of Genesis and ends up with Jesus' birth and life here upon the earth. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, tempted Eve, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity, here it comes, between you and the woman, and between your seed, I've emphasized that for a reason, her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Sounds like some suffering here going on. The seed, 
is going to bruise your head, Satan. That's a mortal wound to the head. And ye shall bruise his heel. Think about that. Who was her seed? That's what's important. And even so, when we were children, we're in bondage on the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. What am I talking about? Who was her seed? When he said that I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. Who was her seed? Well, her seed, of course, was Jesus Christ. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Think about that, her seed. Now let's go again. Who was the seed of Abraham? Now this is much later, after the Garden of Eden and after Eve, after Eve was told, or Satan was told, that the seed of woman would bruise his head. Genesis 22. In blessings I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Here it comes. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because they have obeyed my voice. What do you think about that? He said, in your seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Who was the seed of Abraham? We look back and we talked about the seed of woman. We know that's Christ. Now the seed of Abraham. And I want you to notice the astonishing, the astonishing promise that he made. I will bless thee. I will multiply your seed. Stars of heaven, sand on the seashore. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and your seed will bless all the nations of the earth. It's astonishing. Who was that seed? Well, look here. Galatians, the third chapter. Know ye not, therefore, that they, they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now then, Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation, right? Of course. But he has more children more than we can think of, more than the stars of heaven, the sand upon the seashore. And where'd they come from? Well, of course, they came through Jesus Christ. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, all of the people of God who have obeyed the gospel, they are the children of Abraham. Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. Who was that seed? Well, that seed, of course, was Christ. He was a descendant. And God told him it was about 2,000 years before Christ was born. In your seed, the whole world will be blessed. And, of course, we know that that was Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who was this shallow? This has been a puzzle for many of a scholar and is still somewhat of a puzzle, but just looking at it simply, let's look at this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Of course, that's one of the sons of Israel, isn't it? The 12 tribes. Nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. You know, that just sounds a lot like the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, doesn't it? But Shiloh, who was this Shiloh? Well, he said it would be from Judah. And we look at Hebrews 7 and 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. He was of the tribe of Judah, not of the tribe of Levi, where the priest came. He was of the tribe of Judah. And it was predicted so many, many centuries before, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. The church kingdom and prophecy. Look at this right here. Psalms 45, 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, 
think about the book of Psalms. If this was one of the Psalms of David, you know, he lived a thousand years before Christ was born. And here we have this, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness, hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Who is he, to whom is he, is he speaking? Well, we're told in the New Testament, it quotes that very passage, Hebrews 1 and 8. But unto the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So he's talking to Jesus about Jesus Christ. Way back here in the book of Psalms, and the distance time-wise between Psalms and Hebrews is at least a thousand years. Here in the New Testament, we are told exactly to whom God was speaking, but to the Son, that's Jesus Christ. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And so Jesus has a kingdom, has a throne. Here's God's promise to David. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, if you can keep the sun from coming up or going down, so there will not be day or night in their seat, then if you can do that, my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant. Well, what did you promise David? So that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Why, well, made a promise to the Levites, the priests. You know, I should have inserted here, and I'll ask you to look it up on your own, that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek because he was the king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. Jesus is not only king, but he is priest. As the, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister to me. Who is he speaking? To whom is he speaking? He's speaking to the people of Israel and he's saying that David is going to have a son that will reign on his throne and he will be high priest. And that's what Jesus is. He is the king and the high priest. And here's Daniel's prophecy. Daniel, the second chapter. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a king that will never be destroyed. If you read the whole passage, you understand that he's talking about four great world kingdoms and then the kingdom of God established and he said, in the days of these kings, and he's talking about the emperors of Rome, in the days of these kings, that God will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So he put a time frame on the kingdom. Okay? Now, you premillennialists, you need to look at that if you're expecting Jesus to come back and rapture everybody out and then return seven years later to establish a kingdom. It's to be established during the time of the Roman emperors. And you can't miss that if you'll just study it carefully. Daniel's prophecy. The kingdom, church, and preparation. Here we've had it. Jesus is on earth, right? In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He had one of the most exciting messages that the world has ever heard, especially Judaism and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, these people that heard that message, they were not ignorant of those promises that, you know, there would be the son of David to sit upon his throne. They were not ignorant of Daniel's prophecy of saying, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Well, when they heard that, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there went out to him, to hear him preach, all of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, everybody went out to hear him preach because that exciting message, the kingdom is here. It's close by. Mark the first chapter. Here comes Jesus on the scene. And now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel. What you going to say, Lord? 
He's saying the kingdom of God, the time is filled up, it's fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Did Jesus know what he's talking about? Did Jesus know what he was talking about? He said that the kingdom was very nigh. It was at hand. Did he know what he was talking about? I think he did. The kingdom of God is at hand. Look at Matthew, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? The Simon Peter spoke up and said, you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, born John of for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father is in heaven. And I also say unto you that thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Look at this. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Church, kingdom, same thing. You know, I came over here in my automobile. I expect to leave in the same vehicle. How many vehicles am I talking about? Just one. The church and the kingdom are one and the same. Now then, let's go a little further with that. Is Peter the rock on which Jesus built his church kingdom? That's a fair question. Isn't it? Many people all over the world say that, yes, Peter was the rock. He was the first pope. The church was built on him. No, my friends. The word Petros, which is translated Peter, in the Greek is in the masculine gender. You would expect that, wouldn't you? The apostle Peter was a man, therefore it's in the masculine gender. But the word Petra, for rock is in the feminine gender. You see what I'm talking about? It's not talking about the same thing. Petros and Petra are two distinct words in the Greek. Petros is a shifting, rolling, or an insecure stone, while Petra is a solid, immovable rock. It is the bedrock. And so, no, it wasn't built upon the apostle Peter. He is not the rock. However, let's look at this. In Romans 9, it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank of the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that, here it comes, spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So upon this rock I will build my church. What is he talking about? He's talking about the great confession that the apostle Peter made when he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus then said, it's on that rock, on that rock I will build the church that I am truly the son of God. Something to think about. The church kingdom in perfection. Now then, the church has been in preparation, but now it's established. Look at this. Mark, uh, that is Matthew 16 and 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, you know, that I'm the son of God, I will build my church. Now the reason I have this here and have it underlined I want you to look at that. I will build my church. So in Matthew 16, in Matthew 16, he hadn't built it. But my friends, he was near the cross. He was about to be crucified. And he hadn't built it, but he said, I'm going to. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What does that mean? It means hell here in the sense of the grave of the unseen world. They were going to kill him. They were going to bury him. But he was going to rise from the dead. Now, why have I have this up here? I will build my church. Hadn't done it. But look at Acts 2.47. Acts 2.47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, what does that mean? It means this. That 
between here, Matthew 16, and Acts 2.47, he built the church. He established the church. And when did he do that? Why, well, he did it on the day of Pentecost. You remember that they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, not for you to know the times or the seasons. It's God put in his own power. But you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And he said, you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Samaria, uh, Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. When did they receive that power? On the day of Pentecost. Read Acts 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, the apostles, were all with one accord at one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire and set upon each of them. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The apostle Peter stood up, preached the first sermon. They asked men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And so that great moment, the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ, Christ built the church, established the kingdom. Because here... He is adding to the church. You can't add to something that don't exist. The perfection of the church kingdom. Look at this, Ephesians 2. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, talking to the Gentiles, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, that's the church, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, not just on one, but he says, foundation of the apostles and the prophets Jesus self himself being the chief there's that rock again in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple unto the Lord in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit the perfection of the church or kingdom look at this put all things under his feet gave him to be the head over all things of the church He's the only head. Even as Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. That's just it. Colossians 1, he is head of the body, the church. Look here, he is the savior of the body. Just think about the church and the kingdom are one and the same, and they exist now. The question is, are you a part of it? Are you a part of the perfected kingdom Church of the Lord. Thank you for watching. Time is gone. Earl Barnett's and have a good day. Our God is an awesome God. You have been watching Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. If you need prayer or have comments or questions, feel free to call the Seeking the Lost ministry at 1 800 390 7734. That's toll free 1 800 390 7734. Seeking the Lost is sponsored each week by some area churches of Christ. Until next time, may the good Lord bless you and keep you.